everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I am joined by a very special guest. Now, some of you may know her as the Xenu Crochet Lady here in the SBTV community, but she has got a very incredible story to share. So welcome, Marilyn Honig. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. This is great. <laughs> Exciting. No, it's awesome to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on the channel. Um, so I recently followed you on your Facebook page um, to look at some of your amazing creations. Everybody loves the Xenu costumes you make for the little Micrinda bobbleheads. You are well loved within the community. So I went to go over there and support you. And I saw you had posted this incredible mind blowing story. For those that don't follow on Facebook, uh, Marilyn spent some time in a Pentecostal family attending the uh, Assemblies of God Church. So I was wondering if we could get into it and you could let us know kind of how you got into that in the first place. Well, I was adopted by a Pentecostal family when I was almost nine. Um, my journey to them was very tragic, unfortunately. Uh, when I was young, I my mom and three siblings to a house fire. I was five years old and as you can imagine it was very devastating. I spent uh, several months in the hospital with third degree burns on my hands and second degree on my face so I needed a lot of care. Uh, I just remember feeling very alone but I had a lot of kind people around me. I was lucky to have some kind people but also, unfortunately, I was taken in by some not so kind people. And when I was released from the hospital, I really never knew who had custody of me. If you can imagine a five, six, seven year old couch hopping, that's pretty much what I did for a few years. And finally, Child Protective Services stepped in and placed me in foster care. And I was adopted by this wonderful Christian family. They had nine other kids, so there's 10 of us, and they had three of their own and seven foster kids. This was back in the 70s when those things happened. And they were devout uh, members of the Assemblies of God Church. And I should, I should mention that I was, not, I was not really a prize to behold at that point. I had suffered quite a bit of abuse and trauma. So when I arrived, I probably should have had some trauma counseling, some mental health services. But again, the late 70s, that just really wasn't available as much. In the Christian circles, it was always believed that God would take care of everything. God would heal you, you know, surround you with his love. And there really wasn't a lot of attention to um, things like mental health services. So I was placed in this family. It was a little overwhelming. It was a lot of fun at times having all these siblings and feeling, you know, that I belonged somewhere finally. But the church that we went to, we went at least three times a week, sometimes more. The services could be wild. I'm just telling you, they could be really crazy. It's one of the the hardest starts in life I think I've ever heard of and you know you're such a positive person and really really joyful as well so I'm I'm honestly amazed and in, impressed at how how you've done this so this this assemblies of god church what kind of things do they do in that church that you know maybe they don't do in like a a, a the regular christian church well the assemblies of god is a mainstream pentecostal denomination. So Christianity is such a broad topic, a broad, um, so many denominations, and but they're based on the teachings of the Bible. There's different interpretations sometimes with the basic tenets um, Pentecostals believe. Some are more fundamentalist than others. Some are more sensational than others. Ours was a little bit more on the sensational side at times. In the 70s, it was the charismatic movement was big and there were lots of charismatic people. And I remember times when things would just get really, really crazy. I remember one time 
a big tour bus pulled up at the church and this woman came out this beautiful woman with a long flowing gown and long flowing hair and a big flower in her hair and she was a faith healer and a prophetess is what we were told so she went to the front of the sanctuary and everybody was just worked up into this i just remember the energy was you know almost like i worked up into a like euphoric state and people were, were speaking in tongues you know like kind of babbling syllable, syllables not really speaking like a language but just whatever came out of their mouth jumping up and down raising their hands to god there were healings um but maybe a little suspect but there were some healings going on they would lay hands on people and some of them i think some of them were maybe transported on the bus i'm not sure because it was a small town and i don't i didn't recognize these people that were being healed but Okay, um, there was a couple of um, exorcisms, like people casting out um, demons out of people, a little bit of frothing in the mouth going on and convulsions, which is really scary as a nine, 10 year old. Um, there was something called being slain in the spirit. And they would call people up to the altar and basically put their hand on your forehead and give you a little push backwards and if you were lucky you were caught by an usher that was standing behind you it was like a, like a trust fall you ever have those where you just fall backwards the way it was framed was that the holy spirit would touch you you would start speaking in tongues you'd fall backwards because just the overwhelming spirit of god would you know cause you to fall backwards and some people unfortunately were not caught by the ushers so that was a little little rough for them. I spent the next seven years in the Pentecostal church. Um, there were, you know, good times, bad times, but aside from all the sensational stuff, which was sometimes a little bit kind of fun and funny, <laughs> they had, you know, they'd have puppet shows for us. We'd go on, uh, we had a youth group, we'd go on little trips and it could be fun, but it was very, um, it was very sequestered in a way because we, even though we were in public school, we weren't allowed to listen to music, go to movies, go to dances with our friends. We really didn't, we were, weren't allowed to hang out with anyone outside the church, even if they were Catholics or Baptists or anything. I didn't really have any friends outside the church. Besides all of the sensational stuff, there was a really big emphasis on, um, on the tribulation and Jesus coming back, the second coming, Armageddon, um, a lot of like scared straight stuff about hell. And I don't know if you've ever heard of what the rapture is, but it's based on Bible teachings that Jesus will come back. There could be two people in a field and one will be taken away and the other will stay. And the person that's taken away was right with Jesus or, or God. And the one that's um, left will go through the tribulation and maybe even be martyred. So I was always thinking I'm definitely going to be the one left behind because I could not bail you up. So I'd be in the store with one of my adopted siblings or my adopted mom, and I would lose touch with that. And I would think that the rapture happened. And I'd be so, I'm laughing about it now, but I would be so scared. Yeah, that's so scary. They would scare us about uh, music that was anything secular was satanic they would play records backwards and be like listen listen doesn't that say satan and i'm like i don't hear it but i've heard that there's a sort of conspiracy theory thing that any popular music you listen to you play them backwards you'll hear like the message of the devil or something that's wild so they actually did that then yeah they would and that and really that's the only way I got to listen to rock music was, <laughs> was backwards. Although when I got older, I, I did um, sneak at night with my radio and be listening to Madonna and Prince and all that. It could be really strict and a little bit oppressive. And my parents were just doing what they felt was right, but they were under a lot of pressure to uh, keep our souls pure even though um, we did some pretty crazy things they knew about physically, but it was more like protect your soul even more than your physical being. When I was 16, I just, 
I wanted, I just wanted to be normal. I was in public school. I wanted to feel normal. I ended up just rebelling and saying enough with this. And I ran away and I ended up back in foster care. So the next few years were rough. Yeah. So what, what happened then as in, were you rebelling against, was it your family? Was it the church? Um, where did you go? You know, who found you? How did you get looked after? That sounds crazy. Well, I, I ended up, um, temporarily in a home for runaways and troubled teens, and a nice family took me in, and I stayed with them. I was able to go to the same school, which was nice. So I all of a sudden got into theater, and, and I got to go to dances, and I got to make friends, and it was a great time. It was, you know, I got to go to prom, which was like, you know. <laughs> You think of it like my biggest aspiration in life as a 17 year old. I just wanted to go to prom and I couldn't go if I stayed home. It just sounds crazy, but I just wanted to fit in. I graduated from high school and then I aged out of the foster system. So I was on my own. It was a rough couple of years. I stayed with some friends. I got, I got a job. I was homeless for a while, got my own apartment and was really just trying to make a life for myself. And it's so hard when you don't have a support system. I do have a sister. She unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but she was, um, she did survive the fire and she helped me some too, but we didn't, we weren't raised together because she was so much older than me. When I was 20, I just turned 20. My adoptive parents invited me to come back home and live with them for a while. And I was very reluctant because I was like, I don't want to go back to that crazy church. I didn't want to get involved back in that whole circle again. I was going to say, what was your what was your mental state like then? You said you were homeless. Um, you know, you've gone through that foster care system. You're out on your own. You know, and then you're invited back to to your your adopted parents' house um, to live with them. And you do go. You know, I'm just wondering, like, what your what your mental state must have been like at that time to be willing to go back after you ran away so many years before yeah well there was always that thing in the back of my mind that i i was afraid of going to hell honestly and i had some spiritual experiences that i felt like god had watched over me i i survived up until then and in some ways, it was just a miracle to have survived. So I felt like, you know, God was calling me to be one of his, I don't know, one of his servants. They, they have a lot of words. And we talked about this the other day about all the words that they use that sound really bad when you're in the outside world, like being a servant, you know, being a slave to God. It's supposed to be a really good thing in the church. I just said, okay, well, I guess I made a mess of my own life. Maybe I should try to, you know, make a difference in the world. So I was young. I was looking for direction. Didn't really have much going on. So I went back. 20, right? Like who knows what they're doing at 20 years old? (laughs) Yeah, I guess I could have been doing worse things. I went back home and I started attending the church that uh, it was mostly my adopted mom was really into it. My dad, my adopted dad was just kind of like, oh, whatever, I'll just go along with the program. But, you know, he, he wasn't the driving force in the family like my mom was. So she was really encouraging me to attend these meetings. It was a beautiful old building in Vermont and it was just so pristine and it was fun we um, we'd go to meetings and there were a lot of people my age from different churches and the leader her name was Marlene um, she had been a, a Bible teacher and my mom was saying oh she's not into all that crazy you know um, sensational healing you know healings and slaying the spirit kind of stuff although I found out later there wasn't a lot some of that stuff going still going on so this group was kind of like a little split off group from the main one that you'd been in when you were younger, ran by this Marlene character. Yes, character. Right. And I'll be honest, she sounds awful, but 
Um, could you give us a little insight, kind of what she was like? You know, what you know, was she really charismatic? Did she seem nice? You know, I'm just curious how she could uh, lead this group when some of the things she's done are quite questionable. Yeah. So I, I think that after um, there had been so much emphasis on just all the supernatural and everything in, in the Assemblies of God churches that that surrounded me, there were three of them, actually. It was the one I was brought up in. And there was, one, there was two of them an hour away in each direction. And she started to, Marlene started to have these home Bible studies in different people's homes that were from those three churches. And she recruited about 12 of us um, in our 20s and 30s to start going to her church and, you know, our extended families, like my mom had brought me in. And she was, she could be very, very nice, very motherly. Um, and, you know, I was never super close to my adopted mom. She's a wonderful person, but I never felt really nurtured. She had my kids. You know, she really, she really tried. There was something in me, I think, that wanted to be nurtured and belonged. And she always said to me, you have such a calling. Um, God's going to use you. And again, back then, use, being used is a, was a good thing in the church, being used by God. Now I'm like, so much, not so much. I don't want to be used. So they made you feel kind of like you had a special calling or something. Yes, yes. And, and this appeal to really, you know, rolling up your sleeves and digging into the Bible and, and trying to understand, you know, there's so many contradictions and different translations in the Bible. So I got stacks of Hebrew, Greek lexicons and commentaries, and I was just really digging into the scriptures. I, I know a little more of the Bible than I <laughs> care to admit, I think, but she, she really encouraged, you know, the study and yeah, we're going to be different. We're going to really know the, the truth. Just to give a little background, the ministry that she started was called the Door of Hope. And it's from a verse in the Bible that uh, says something like, the Valley of Acor will become a door of hope. Now, the Valley of Acor, if I'll just give you a really quick little antidote about that from the Bible, is the Valley of Acor was a place that this guy back in the Old Testament named Achan had gone through a battle um, with the, the Jewish people, um, the Israelites, and he they won the battle and he took some spoils for himself them. Now, when God found out and told the leaders of the Israelite um, tribes, he was um, unalived very brutally with his entire family, um, tiny children, women, you know, they had a lot, of, well, a lot of family, a lot of wives back then, and were, yeah, un very brutally unalived with all of their possessions and um, burned to oblivion and God's judgment. Oh, well, there's lots of stories like that in the Bible. For every nice, for every nice, sweet, loving verse, even in the New Testament, that someone can quote, you know, oh, God is love and he loves you and gave his son. I can think of one equally as not so nice and condemning, probably from the same book. But the Bible is a one is is a wonderful book. There's so many nice stories. I think that if people believe every word of it, it can be a little confusing because there are so many contradictions, but it does give people so much um, peace. And and I don't think Christianity isn't, it's not a cult and even Pentecostalism, but there's so many things that can just spin off from that that can be dangerous. As soon as you're in, in a group where there's one leader and they are, you know, dictating how you live your life, how they punish you, how they make you think, you know, that's when you're dealing with a cult. And unfortunately, with all all religions, when things branch off and people have new ideas, that's where that kind of cult mindset can kind of come into play, isn't it? Um, which sounds like is what, what has happened with this um this Mar Marlene's cult. I don't know what, what are we call it. Do we have a name for it? Door of Hope, would you call it that maybe? Door of Hope, yes. So the Door of Hope is like a is a ministry where you live there 
you live in in the building you live with other people who are also part of this so what is your what is your job what do you guys do what's your day look like okay so the door of hope was um turned into a religious nonprofit, which was um, essentially a church we lived in the building uh, there was about 15 of us there were marlene two of her um aides that were were kind of like spies Spy. <laughs> yes there was a there was a snitch culture going on there well you know you got you got a bunch of uh, people in their 20s and 30s and there couldn't be anything going on so you know we had to be we had to be chaperoned in surveillance there was a congregation that would come for sunday services and um Wednesday night Bible studies. And so it was a church, but there was also like that inner um, ministry going on where there was all of us living there. And it was sort of like a very tiny microcosm of like the Sea Org. <laughs> like we were like the Sea Org. So we were tightly controlled. We wanted to be there. So for the most part, we really, really tried. I know I tried to obey the rules. What were some of the rules you had to follow? It was um, no... Um, fraternizing with the opposite sex unless you had permission and even then you really couldn't hold hands you um you pretty much had to be planning on getting married if you were even alone in a room together pretty much i don't want to get ahead of myself i'll tell you a little bit about the day-to-day -day life there but there, there was a big emphasis on being humbled and broken before God and being what they call empty vessels. So you were supposed to empty yourself. You can think of what that might mean psychologically and mentally and emotionally, constantly um, going before God. You'd, you'd have to be in a room by yourself and just you know, confessing your sins and just crying before God to have mercy on your soul, that he would save you. We were, we were always being made to um, fast quite a bit, at least one day a week, and then it turned into three days. Um, I never got to the 10 day fast, but some of my housemates did. And one of them was found on the road, wandering around a back road, hallucinating after not eating for 10 days and some of my housemates and unfortunately two of them I had brought in and recruited if you will I always felt responsible later on but both of them literally ended up going insane and it was just awful it was awful these um these fasts you had to do would uh, Marlene do them as well? Was she part of it? Did she? Did you all do them together? <laughs> well, I heard rumors that she she uh, would sneak cookies to her room, but I didn't personally witness that. But uh, it really looked like she was fasting. But the rest of us got very very thin. As you can see now, I've made up for it. I love to cook. I love food. Could be because of all the deprivation <laughs> way back when. But there were a lot of contradictions going on. She would expect us to not have an opinion, not really, she would say things like, uh, take up your cross and follow me, follow Jesus. So if you know, the cross is a, is a tool of crucifixion, is a tool of execution. And we were constantly being told, you know, die to yourself, die to your own will, the will of God. I had such a hard time trying to figure out what the will of God was, but guess what? Marlene knew what the will of God was. Of course she did. <laughs> what a quinky dink. She knew what the will of God was. There were times when I did, never really knew what I did to be either in favor or out of favor with her slash God, because I'd be doing the same thing and she'd say, oh, God's so happy with you right now. You're doing great. And I'm like, really? I don't know what I'm doing. And all of a sudden, Marilyn, you need to go before the board. Now, going before the board was the scariest thing. It was like a court martial. And usually it was something that wasn't an actual thing that you did. It was something that was supposedly found in your heart that Marlene or one of the elders had gotten in their um, spirit. When they were seeing God, they're like, oh, that Marilyn, she needs to have you lay your hands on her. So another little uh, vocabulary lesson is that 
in the real world, if someone lays their hands on you, that's a that's not a good thing. That's like a violent act, right? Like, don't lay your hands on me. This was more of a gentle laying of, on of hands, but it really was a mental, emotional, and spiritual assault, I'll say. And it was a very humbling thing having three or four older people that were supposedly your spiritual um, elders putting their hands on your head, on your shoulders, and starting to pray to God, babbling in the tongues again, all the syllables, you got that going on, um, rebuking the devil, uh, casting out demons out of me. And the scariest thing was when I would be praying and she would have her eyes closed and she'd open one eye and she'd look at one of her cronies, one of her yes men, and say, I want I don't want to mention their names because they're they were victims too. But would say, Hey so and so, God told me that you have a word for Marilyn. And she would just be like, Okay, I gotta come up with a word. You can almost see the, the smoke coming out of her ears. So the word, one of the times that I got my hands laid on me, your hands laid on me, was the word was a can. Hearing the word Achan in the spirit. Now, Achan, if you remember, was the guy that hid the gold and silver from the battle under his tent and was unalived very brutally. So that's that was um, what I guess I had a spirit of Achan in me. So I was hiding something. That shocks me. It's crazy how they get you into that mindset oh my gosh for me hearing you it sounds like there's so much like fear around it around the consequences for not doing the right thing as as Marlene has said it to you you know like you said the snitch culture could you talk to even anyone else in there about what was happening it was very nebulous it was like unspoken it was just an under an unspoken rule is understood that you do not question things you don't speak um bad about Marlene, you you can go to her and tattle on other people and that would often get you favor. But there was unless she was unless that person you were tattling on she liked more at the moment, it was um very unstable. Like you're walking on eggshells because you never knew when the the other shoe was gonna drop. It was it was scary. And usually um in those sessions I would end up just backing down, just be like, whatever, whatever they, I felt like they expected me to say, I would just say it. And I'd be like, yes, I'm sorry. I have a spirit of Achan. Now, you know, when, when those are, those things are happening and everyone is just pressing down hard on you as far as, you know, emotionally and spiritually, and even the hands on you, you feel like you just want, you just want the pressure to be off. And when it was over with, you'd have almost like a euphoric relief. And you'd be like, that must be God cleansing me and I'm in favor again. And oh, thank God that's over. It's I can go on again. So the next time, you never knew who the next time was. My husband had lived in the same ministry, was a really good friend. There really wasn't anything romantic going on. There really wasn't, couldn't be. And then when I was, we had, been there over five years and we just really grew um, closer and he's just such a fantastic guy we're still together we'll be married 26 years we've been through a lot together and he puts up with me so I'm grateful for that and I don't know where I'd be you know if I didn't have him so it was Duncan by the way it's so lovely that that you've had this um you know, maintain this relationship and you've got somebody as well who's got that shared experience. So I bet you've made each other so much um, stronger. From talking to you, Marilyn, you're, you know, you're a funny person. You got a rebellious sort of streak in you. You say what you think. So, you know, I'm imagining like 20 year old you in this group, you know, and, and, that rebellious state just somewhere being in there did they you know apart from laying hands on you did they do anything else like to kind of try keep you in line to try to keep you um on the path of what what they wanted for you yes there there were tasks that you were given that were i think now looking back were kind of designed to kind of 
humble you, which was again, supposedly a good thing um, that God would break you. I'm thinking now it was humiliation. It was humiliation. Like I had to um, clean toilets with my bare hands, the inside of the toilet bowl with no gloves. Marlene was big on using ammonia water for everything. And there was, we had buckets, buckets of water with ammonia in them. And I take these rags and we would wash, I would wash walls, baseboards, floors, like with my hands, bit, um, door jams. There were these racks and racks of uh, little spice jars. And I would take that ammonia water and I'd be washing the spice jars. And I think it was a way to just get you just keeping busy work, just ridiculous, you know, arbitrary busy work so that you couldn't think about what you were letting yourself be subjected to. Most nights we would sit in this um, big living room, all 50 bucks or, or so, and we'd be listening to these cassette players of sermons, um, only approved ones that Marlene wanted us to hear, which were usually um, laced with a lot of hellfire and brimstone. So you're sitting there listening to just being indoctrinated in all of this stuff. And I, uh, I think part of the reason why I, my, my sanity was preserved was um, I would crochet the entire time. So I just would keep crocheting while I'm listening to these Hellfire and Brimstone. <laughs> Hellfire and Brimstone is basically any teaching that invokes the fear of hell in you. It could be, you know, placing judgment on you as God's people, or it could be, oh, those heathens out there, they're going to be swallowed up and, you know, condemned. And so it was just this emphasis on you better stay right or there's hell to pay, literally, you know. So that was always hanging over your head. And some relief finally came for, um, for Duncan and I when we we got permission to get married. I was 26. He was 38 years older than me. Um, and we we got a home a few miles away down the road. And we were still pretty tightly controlled, but at least we could breathe a sigh of relief. We were still very involved. Um, Duncan would go up and do a lot of the maintenance and help. It was a big old building. Hundreds. So it was a lot of, still a lot of work, but we were just happy to have a little bit of breathing space. And having not even held, holding hands, all of a sudden being married, it was a little, a little bit crazy, you know, the whole purity culture. And then, oh, yeah, they're, they're married, you know. So we had kids right away. Go on. <laughs> we had, um, Three lovely children. Yeah, we skipped Bible study three times. <laughs> um, so we have three lovely children. I was happy to really have a family of my own. I really wanted that. And they're just, they were just my life. They still are. And we were raising them in the church and bringing them to you know, all the services and everything. I, I homeschooled them until we left. And that was wild, trying to homeschool three kids. I didn't feel qualified at all to, to homeschool, but it was expected. All of the indoctrination, you just didn't really question it. It was kind of laid out for you. And there was so much isolation that that's all I knew um, and what was expected. And we didn't really know much about what was going on in the outside world. This is the 90s. I never saw an episode of Friends or Seinfeld. Or... That blew my mind. I couldn't believe that. I was like, how did you miss Friends? <laughs> I know. But there was no, no outside media, just books and cassettes and crochet. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. So a turning point for me, for us, was we had been through quite a bit of um, this church discipline emotional, spiritual abuse, all of a sudden, Marlene started to turn on my children. And I always had that thing in me. I think it's a, it's just a fire inside of me that just, she could never really snuff out. She could never really break. And when she started to turn on my children, 
the mama bear in me started to rise up. And that that just what didn't set well with me, even though we were told that, you know, this was for the right thing. And we were told that my my oldest, who is my only daughter, um, had evil spirits in her and needed to be had hands laid on her. And I wish I had just grabbed her and ran out of there that day. I, you know, it's something that I wish I could go back and do that. And unfortunately, they laid hands on her, cast out spirits out of her. And I apologize to her about that all the time. Actually, I just apologized to her about that yesterday. <laughs> She's like, it's okay, mom. It's okay. I'm fine. Hey, how old how old was she when, when this happened? She was seven years old. Supposedly had all these evil spirits, including a spirit of Jezebel. Go figure, right? So they performed an exorcist off. And she was a very good girl, real just a sweetheart, but she also had a little bit of a self willed rebellious streak. And I wonder where she gets that from. Her father. No, definitely not her, fa <laughs> definitely not her father. So the church, it was a um, nonprofit church. They had signed up with the government to become a food pantry. And it was supposed to be, the food pantry was supposed to be open to the community. Because if you take government funds to have um, food subsidies, subsidies, I think it's called, um, you're supposed to be able to go to that church Many churches have food pantries, but because they were so isolated, they were so, um, you know, suspicious of the outside world, they didn't advertise for the community to come and get the food. It was always an us versus them. The outside world was evil. They pretty much kept the food for themselves. And my daughter, one day, they just had all this, like, granola bars and fruit snacks and stuff that they weren't distributing. And she said she... I didn't know this till later, but she took a little pack of chiclets. She was hungry. They were there. She just took some chiclets. So then she had to have a full-on tribunal, seven years old, to um, have demons out of her. The demon of chiclets. Oh, my gosh. For snacks? <laughs> yes. Taking a snack. What? So would you say then this moment with this, was, was this – when you were like, I got to get out of here. Like, you know, what the heck is this? So how do you get to the point where you're like, I'm done with this. I need to go. We had been in the church for 14 years at this point, And the veil over my head was just so strong. But I think that was definitely the first straw. Kind of got the ball rolling. I felt like if myself, my husband, my kids were going to be accused of being rebellious, accused of all these things, why not just do some of it? You know, it's like, just, I'm already going to be accused of having rebellion. I'm just going to start rebelling a little bit. We started to have a little bit of fun. Well, nothing really crazy, but my husband and I would pop a bottle of wine at night. We'd start watching some movies. Do you remember what, like, what was the first like forbidden movie you watched? Do you remember? Oh, jeez, I don't remember. I mean, we weren't even that crazy. We we got really into um, fight movies. Like, I love the Rocky movies. I think the Rocky movies kind of kind of gave us, you know, some some oomph. I think we uh, Rocky movies saved our lives. Now, <laughs> there's this quote. There's this quote in the uh, Rocky movie that says, it's not about how hard you're hit. It's about how many times you can get hit and keep moving forward. I always remembered that. It's like, yeah, I've been hit pretty hard quite a few times, but just keep getting up. And I, I don't know if you, um, we love the Monty Python movies, but the one with the knight that just keeps getting his limbs lopped off. And he's like, it's merely a flesh wound. That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm you know what? The Rocky movies are a good shout. I'm glad you've gone for some classics. And Prince and uh, Madonna for your music. Loving that. You know, she's got good taste. What was it then that made you actually go, I'm going? Marlene started to, I would say, come a little bit unhinged. Things were in the church were becoming way more intense. More of the us versus them. Um, the emphasis on the end times and um, the tribulation, Armageddon and all that stuff. She started to um, have contact with um, some um, Jewish Christians 
that um, had this message that there would be a great tribulation and and we in, in rural Vermont would be called to be part of type of an underground railroad for the Jews that in the end times the Jews would flee and we would be welcoming them and this was supposed to happen in Marlene's lifetime which she's in her mid 80s now and I haven't really seen that happen so just a little, little side note there. So up until then, they had been renting that big old building, but because everybody had either left or been married off, there were a lot of splits in the church. Ma, my uh, adopted mom had a falling out with her and left. So there really weren't that many people in there anymore. And because they couldn't make the rent, they um, had to move out. Well, my husband's um, aunt had passed away recently, and he had some inheritance. And he and another um, older man in the church who had some pension money pulled their money together and got and put down a down payment for them to have a new church building. And um, while they were fixing it up a little bit, it was in good shape, but they were fixing it up and renovating it a little bit. And my husband was always going up there and doing maintenance. And Marlene asked him to um, paint the inside of the rooms, you know, her bedroom room and she picked out the paint he painted it she didn't like the shade the paint so she picked out another shade and he painted it all again hours and hours of painting she didn't quite like that shade either so he painted it a third time and even though that seemed like a small thing to me i was like wait a minute i'm not supposed to have any preferences any any opinions I'm supposed to give my will to God. I'm not supposed to have, like, I'm supposed to empty myself when she's getting this free house and free, you know, free labor and three colors of paint. And I mean, I was, I was wearing like pretty much, um, secondhand clothing and she had a closet full of gorgeous clothes, London fog coat. L.L. Bean, you know, I don't know if you know the, the brands over here, but, you know, nice, nice clothes. So that just didn't set well with me. And I just started to push back a little bit, just be like, oh, you know, dropping little hints that I didn't think that was right. She called my husband one day and said that God gave her a word about Marilyn and she wanted to come down to our home and come in and lay hands on me again. She said, I'm coming down to lay hands on Marilyn. God gave me the word. I have a scripture for her. It's not like a police warrant. You can't just do that. If that's what it felt like. So, and, and it was like, she was sending him in to tell me that this was going to happen. Okay. So he kind of sheepishly comes in and he knows this is going to go over well. So I'm folding laundry and he's like, um, Marlene wants to come down and lay. I dropped the laundry basket and I threw myself on the floor. I cowered in the corner and I was screaming and I was flailing my arms like I was like I was swatting bees and I'm screaming, no, don't let her come, don't let her come. And he looks at me and he was horrified. He just kind of okay, like like, don't worry. I won't let her. I won't let her. I promise. You know, so he told her, no, you don't do that. You don't tell Marlene. No. So guess what? So we were called before the board, both of us. And we went, we went up there to be called before the board and got put in a room with the other elders and people that we knew and loved for the past 16 years. Now we had been married almost 10 years. And um, we were condemned. There were all kinds of words against us that, you know, we were going to hell. Um, we were going to end up on the dumb heap, which was the shit pile. You know, so, yeah. And I looked around the room and saw all the people that I loved, and they just all looked at the floor. They couldn't, didn't stick up for us. And usually the way it would go was we would back down. We would be like, okay, you're right. We're sorry. We'll repent. And please forgive us. Bring us back in the fold. But this time, we didn't back down. And we just laid it all out. We're like, listen, this isn't right. I didn't know anything about cult. I didn't know I was in a cult. I just knew I'd had 
enough. And something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. So we just told them, we're done. And we went home. And the next day, Marlene sent out a mass email saying that there was sin. There were enemies in the camp, which were us. We were the enemies in the camp. And none of them were to talk to us. And they, she did send a few of them down um, to our house to knock on our door. And we were told that, you know, we were going to be lost. Our kids were going to be lost. Terrible things were going to happen to them. We were going to end up on the dung heap. The dung heap was really big, big threat. I was scared. I mean, we stood our ground, but because we only lived a few miles away, they would drive by in the cars. I was afraid to leave my house. I was afraid to go outside. I used to take walks on the road. I couldn't do that anymore. I was scared. And I wasn't scared that they would physically run me over or hurt me, but I was scared that they would put curses on me, that they would pray that God would break me even more, that they would pray. And that was very powerful, very powerful control. Sorry, that's blown my mind a bit. It's, that's so intense. It reminds me so much of this, like the disconnection policy that they have in Scientology, you know, like you're told that you're condemned, you're like a bad person or whatever. And then all of your friends that are sat there while this is happening, look at the floor, shun you and don't speak to you again. Like, yeah. And you said before, like you, most of your friends or if not all of your friends were people that were inside um, this church. So, so when you left then, like, who did you turn to for support? Like who helped you or was a friend to you when, when you um, left that? We were pretty much alone. Although I have two uh, younger adopted sisters that, were um, my adopted mom's natural children. And I'm so close to them to this day. And they they saw what was going on years ago. They, they, didn't, they didn't stay. And they always loved me unconditionally. And they, you know, had witnessed firsthand, like what had happened pretty much. So I did have my family back, which was wonderful, you know. And um, I started to, it was hard for me to trust anyone at first because, you know, all of a sudden, the the outside world is so evil. You you just think all these people have horns, and they're going to be so mean, and they're they're going to they're all going to hell, and you're going to end up on the dung heap with them. You know, so it was hard for me to trust. But over the years, I just realized oh, I'm still here. It's okay, and you just start to let people in, and you just realize there's a big wide world out there. And I started um, working. Um, full time doing retail and met a lot of people, and I realized that I had been down so much for so many years that I was like, you know, what? I love people. I love all kinds of people. I love every, you know. All of a sudden, I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm alive, and uh, I love gay people, and I love, you know, I just love everybody, right? Everybody. I don't care what religion you are, you know. And it was just so freeing to just be able to not constantly be. Oh, I don't know about that person. No, it was just very liberating to just be able to be up there. I started to do um, some volunteer work, and about um, four years ago now, I started. I founded a nonprofit that um, aids fire survivors and other vulnerable pop, uh, populations, such as elderly and homeless. And during COVID, we did a lot of um, a lot of aid just giving care packages to um, the elderly people that were shut in their homes. And it's just a wonderful, cathartic thing to be able to give back to the community. So I, I just, I love it. I think you're absolutely amazing. Your story is so moving, but the, I think the thing that's so amazing about it is you have this undeniable strength, you know, this undeniable strength, this undeniable courage, which I, I think is incredible where where do you get that from where do you get that strength from i think that it's in everyone i think it is i think it's just that thing inside of you that just has this um will to survive no matter what you know and it's just so great that um we have a community of people that really 
just understand where, you know, each other have been, what we've been through and can just encourage each other no matter what, no matter what stage you're in, no matter whether you're possibly still in a cult, not sure if you're in a cult, in an abusive relationship, there's, there's always hope and just keep, keep getting back up and moving forward. That's all I can say. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Some beautiful advice there. Thank you. So obviously everyone in the SPTV community, they know you for your amazing, amazing creations that you, you have uh, posted and shared around. Um, you know, how did you find yourself in this little corner of YouTube with all of us lot? <laughs> well, um, so I think it was in maybe 2017, 2018, I started to uh, watch the Aftermath show with Leah Remini and Mike Render, just fell in love with them. I cried through every episode and I could relate to so much of it. And I, at the time, I didn't even, I still couldn't even admit to myself that I was in a cult. And then by the, by the end of that, I was like, holy shit, I was in a cult. I was in a, I was in a call big time like wow whoa it was still hard for me to even talk about it because i would have friends that i was um, reuniting with from high school and stuff they're like where have you been for 25 years and i'm like i was in a call you know it was very hard to admit and um then for the next few years i started to really kind of just tinker around on, on YouTube and Google and started learning about cults. And I love the, uh, the fair game podcast. Listen to every single episode of, of that twice with me and Mike. And I just adore Mike and I absolutely adore Claire. I'm sorry guys, but Claire is, she's my girl. I just love, I'm a Claire bear. And I, I've been uh, watching, you know, A.A. Ron and, and all of, all of the whole crew just love them. And one night, Mark and Claire were um, announcing that they had this contest going on with the bobblehead, Mike Render bobbleheads. And I had bought to, um, to help, you know, support the Aftermath Foundation. I love what they're doing, helping people escape Scientology. That's wonderful. And I decided to crochet a Mike Render bobble new bobble outfit and I have them right here and I sent in the picture and Mark and Claire loved it and so I crocheted a whole bunch of these and sent them to A, Ron, Mike and, and Claire and Mark and then I don't know it just started happening and then I made a this is the Duke of Chug and <laughs> in honor of another another alien villain of LRHs. And I just, I wanted to make it a little bit, I wanted to make it British looking. And and uh, you and you and Apostate Alex have um, these on the way to you, just say. They are brilliant, honestly. They are absolutely brilliant. Um, I love as well that you, know, you mentioned earlier, like when you had to like listen to these tapes and things, you would be crocheting. You know, and this this is um, you know, something that got you through that, and and something that you've turned into such a positive thing. It's it's so hilarious as well. Like, you know, you've made so many people smile from your creation. So I hope I hope you're so proud of yourself for that. I was just saying, laughter is the best medicine, right? Yes, yes, laughter is for sure the best medicine. Ever, absolutely. Um, I can relate to you with um, the watching the Aftermath show, Leah Remini and the uh, Scientology and the Aftermath. Watching it, I just was so amazed by everyone's courage and, and how strong they were all for coming out and, and speaking out, knowing you know, what was going to come their way. Um, when I shared my story, I don't know if you can relate to this, but um, that gave me some courage to, you know, speak up and, and go, this this is this is the right thing to do. Absolutely. And I, I think that is part of the healing process as well, because like I said, I was so scared for so many years and I still live in the same house. So what's different now is that I think once I started to speak out and explain where I'm coming from, 
and what happened to me and everything, it like broke the power that off of over me. It now I don't, I'm not afraid anymore. It's like, I'm like, bring it on. It's merely a flesh wound. You're so strong. And I, I want to commend you on your, you know, your transparency, your bravery, how, how you've been able to be vulnerable today. Um, if, if anybody wants to come and support you or find you, how, how can they do that, Marilyn? Well, um, you can follow my Facebook. If you like crochet, <laughs> you can follow my Facebook page. Uh, we have a little Facebook group that has been formed from all of the SBTV fans and Crafty fans. Uh, it's called um, Coffee, Cults, and Crafts. <laughs> and you're on it, Kelly, right? I am, yes, I am a member. Three of my favorite things. <laughs> yeah, me too. And if anybody wants to uh, check out the um, nonprofit, it's called, it's BerkshireHelpingHands.org. You can check that out online and see what we're up to uh, here in the county. Yeah, I will link both of those groups um, in the description below so you can go and check them out. Um, Marilyn, thank you so much for coming and doing this interview. You are an incredible person. You're such a positive light in this community. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And I am a huge fan of uh, in-flight entertainment. <laughs> I just love you. I just, yeah, I just adore you, Kelly. And I love your, just your vibe and your smile and your talent. I mean, look behind you. You've got so much creativity. Your videos are amazing. You know, I feel honored and privileged to call you my friend and be able to share my story with you. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Marilyn. You are a legend. Um, go check out those links in the description below, everyone. Thank you for watching. Please show some love to Marilyn in the comments. I'm sure she will love to read and respond to them. Um, other than that, that's all from us for now. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.